Hey everyone, and welcome to our DAT IQ weekly market update. This is our update for July 22nd, 2020. I'm Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics at DAT, joined by the perspicacious Ned Damon, Principal Data Scientist at DAT, and Dean Croak, Principal Industry Analyst at DAT. You know, they say absence makes the heart grow fonder, but what do you think about that, Ned? I mean, I, I see you, I'd say, on the order of every other day. So so it's not that you that I'm missing, but I definitely miss the, the show and and getting together. So um, really, really looking forward to, to having this again and also having friend of the pod, Dean Croak, on. Great to be here. Yeah, so next week we're going to have our CEO, Claude Pamelia, um, on the show. Uh, so we have to be on our best behavior, just so everyone's aware. But um, he's going to take questions, and he'll be talking about trends in the market and leading through COVID and what he's hearing from some of his counterparts in uh, upper leadership positions in the industry. So if you have any questions for Claude, um, please feel free to send those to askiq at dat.com. Uh, we will be compiling those over the next week, and be sure to get those um, over to marketing so that we can get them ready for Claude. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Ned. Thank you very much, Kent. This has been a, a spicy week. Uh, rates are continuing to move against trends um, in the upward direction, which is great, but load posts and truck searches are remaining flat in contrast, which is um, very unusual given that rate trend. Um, truck trips are down about 11% versus pre-COVID levels, but the spot market, at least from the rate side, is remaining strong. Um, and we suspect that it's due to erratic demand from out of balance carrier networks. And we're actually gonna be having a little bit of a round table where we talk more about this kind of unusual behavior. And um, there's a lot of open questions about what's gonna be coming out of the, the, hollowed, the hallowed halls of Congress about uh, what the next, if there is going to be a next stimulus package is going to look like. And I think that's macro factors are going to be driving a lot of things, but I'm, I'm kind of jumping the gun here. So why don't we first talk about the, the, the data in front of us and go into market dynamics, Ken? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Ned. Um, we're going to walk through some of the typical market dynamics charts and graphs this week, um, but I'm really excited to get through this and get to our round table at the end, because I think that's going to be able to share um, kind of more interesting perspectives, you know, looking at more than just the data, but jumping in drive and load to truck ratios this week. We've seen it bobble a bit after the 4th of July, but overall it's more plateauing. We'd have expected more of a fallback, but again, this really isn't a normal um, season um, to, to, to try to make those predictions. Um, looking at reefer load board activity, a little bit more closely linked to normal seasonality. It's, it's more plateaued than what we would have expected, but we also didn't see um, as much of an enormous spike up as we saw in 18 and 17. So, you know, we're watching them very closely. We're also watching the load and truck posts to kind of get an idea of what's driving that ratio. Um, and again, it's all signs are pointing to non-normalcy at the moment. I'm going to look at dry van MCI and, you know, Southern California, South Texas, um, sort of the northern part of the southeast United States, as weird as that is to say, all showing relative strength. But you're starting to see it permeate even a bit into um, the traditional Midwest area. Still cooler in the Great Lakes area. Um, suspicion there is just kind of not returned to full production from an automaker and tier one auto parts supplier standpoint. Um, Reefer MCI, kind of continuing to see the same trends. Um, strong patterns of heat in the south, pretty much all of Texas except central Texas is lit up, Southern California, um, and even starting again to push up into the more upper Midwest regions. We're starting to see that heat. So I'm going to switch to spot rate trends real quick because honestly, that's really the story of the week, um, especially on the dry van side. So we have the dry van chart here. This is year over year rates with the red line being 2020. And it's almost hard to see because the line thickness is wide. But, you know, right after the 4th of July, we saw rates want to start to come back down. And that was after really overshooting where we expected them to peak out at. Um, so, you know, showing some substantial growth over 2019, they sort of reversed course and started climbing back up. And at this point, we're sitting within earshot of the high water mark of this graph anyway, which would be 2018. So we're watching that very closely, and I think we'll have some interesting perspectives to share um, when we have our, our discussion later in the video. Looking year over year, it's just a remarkable story. And when rates fell off last year after the 4th of July, it was already a pretty sort of melancholy year for rates in general. But like 30, 35 cents above where we were this time last year, which is really remarkable from a year-over-year -year gain perspective, um, especially with 
the underlying fundamentals being the way that they are in the market right now. Um, looking at reefer, again, same with load to truck ratio. You see a more pronounced seasonality, but then the rate starting to want to fight back against seasonality in the past week or so. So we saw them peak up a little bit higher than they were last year, really kind of come over and you see a pronounced cresting pattern. But now they're starting to inch back up. So it'd be interesting to see what happens here. Um, you know, they serve large, two very different markets with reefer being more food service, um, restaurants, grocery, um, medical devices, pharmaceuticals, things like that. And on the reefer you have, on the driving side, you tend to have more kind of boxed goods, um, raw materials, things like that. On the short term reefer spot rate year over year, again, not as pronounced of a year over year game, but we're still talking on the order of 20 cents. So whereas in 2019, which is the blue line, things crashed pretty hard after the 4th of July, as is seasonally typical. This year has been more of a plateauing effect. And as a result, it's not necessarily that reefer rates have continued to increase. It's just the year over year comps look better because they fell last year. So all of that being said, I think it's really interesting to hear what Ned's gonna say this week about forecasting models because you know, if there's been one constant over the past few months, it's been changed. So really interested to see what the models are showing. Well, it's definitely exciting times off in forecast land. We have a lot of model dispersion. So I'm going to start off by looking at our van forecasts. So uh, you can see in the blue line are actual rates paid by market participants um, historically. And then once you get to the right edge of the chart, you come into the forecast land where we, we are forecasting what's going to be going forward. We have a suite of models. We have our rate cast model in green. We have our short term model in red. And then we have two blended models that are uh, mixtures of the two in different ways and in different proportions. So the rate cast model is expecting that uh, the plateau is going to plateau and maybe have a slow glide down. Uh, it's kind of uh, accepted the fact that uh, the fourth of the post fourth of July slump isn't slumping and um, is assuming that we're going to try and trend back to more normal seasonality whereas the short term model is continuing up into the right and uh, off into the range where I said that I would eat my hat so I'm going to get a dry rub prepared because the short term model has been performing very well um, over the last couple of weeks moving forward to uh, reefer you can see that same model dispersion almost immediately. There is there is right away a disagreement between whether um, the short term and the rate cast model. Uh, again, the blue line is historicals, actual rates paid by market participants, and then the forecasts are off to the right, and the short term model is continued up into the right, whereas the rate cast model is kind of settled at this plateau of 210 a mile, which is, very high for this year and not following traditional seasonal patterns. I think this brings us very well to the question, which is um, in this world where there is a huge divergence from the standard seasonal pattern, um, what does that mean? What, what does it mean going forward and, and what kinds of things can we expect? So uh, Dean, do, uh, Ken, do you want to start? Yeah, I just wanted to tee up our discussion because this has been an interesting um, this has been an interesting use case for why we blend actual human intelligence with artificial intelligence in our modeling, right? We've sort of been very deliberate at DAT about how we've assembled this cast of um, industry expertise from all different parts of the industry, whether that be shipper, carrier, broker, uh, traditionally trained data scientists, um, to really kind of give us a collective understanding because normal is only normal part of the time, right? We see these periods where things divert from the norm and we're, we're, we're firmly in one of those periods right now. So um, the theme of this discussion really is gonna be what are things outside of the database telling us? And I think a great way to open that up um, is to lean on our relationships. We have great relationships with our customers and industry partners. Um, and sometimes you, you, there's no substitute for picking up the phone and giving them a call and seeing what their ground truth is and how that reinforces beliefs you found in the data or you know, sometimes contradict what the data is telling you. Um, and talking with Dean this week, he had a great conversation with um, uh, a couple of carriers actually. And I wanted, wanted to ask him to fill us in on what, what he heard um, and how that um, helps guide our understanding of what's happening. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, you know, freight forecasting has never been more challenging um, as no one's really got historic freight uh, during a pandemic in particular, certainly not that I'm aware of, but 
Um, what I've seen is that we do have at DAT uh, great data from yesterday, last week, last month, in particular during the pandemic, uh, that explains what's going on in the market. And um, you know, I was when we prepped for the show, I was I was reminded of an interview that Derek Leathers, the CEO of Werner, had with um, uh, on CNBC, where he said that his networks were way out of balance. And, uh, and, and then I, I sort of reflected on the last Great Recession in 2009 where we lost about 25% of our capacity in one year. What that meant from a predictive modelling and forecasting perspective was that that year was no longer representative of how the, year, how the industry typically works seasonally. So uh, when we were building predictive models, um, you know, in the 2010-11 period, we had to truncate the 2009 data because it just was so abnormal. And, and I'm seeing the same things happening in data now where uh, compared to 2009, of course, the cause is very different. But from a data perspective, we're seeing things behave very differently in the market. And that's why uh, th th these are sort of unprecedented times. You know, we're seeing spot market rates up in the 1% to 2% range week over week, which is really unusual when you think about you know, ATA came out yesterday with their truck tonnage index saying that freight volumes are down 1.3% year over year. Uh, today's USDA truckload produce report shows that truckloads of produce shipments are down about 13% year over year. Uh, CAS's freight shipments index said uh, last week 18% decrease in shipments. And today's US Bank freight payment index shows that shipments are down 8% and the spend index is down about 14%. So one of the great questions is why volume's up? Uh, so why why are rates up and if volumes uh, down so much? That's the that's the challenging question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, I mean, did you hear you know when you were talking to the carriers, uh, Dean? That kind of well, how, how is this impacting them? Yeah, it was the same. It was like on the interview with Derek Leathers, it was fascinating because he said he, his business is like like an airline network. Trucking networks are, are highly optimized, and he said. When the pandemic hit New York, and it's a great case study because New York was coming out the other side and production levels are increasing, but he said when the pandemic hit New York, they had so many trucks going in, so consumption was very high as people were in lockdown, but production levels were at their lowest because people weren't working. So what it meant was these trucks were going into New York but having to come out empty, creating this imbalance in the network. And I think what's happening now, we're seeing that same New York imbalance happen in other markets as the pandemic sort of rages through different freight markets. And, and that was echoed by a carrier I spoke to yesterday who runs around 3,000 trucks and he said his network uh, is way out of balance during the pandemic. They're rejecting more contract loads than they ever have before. Uh, his trucks are ending up in different areas. They're running more empty miles. Their revenue per tractor week is down. Uh, they're constantly having to re-optimise their network due to the imbalance and their, and their shippers, because their trucks aren't in the same place they would expect them to be, uh, their shippers are having to go to the spot market for this excess volume on certain lanes or for loads that the contracted carriers just don't have trucks back in those areas to, to load. So what that's done, uh, because of the imbalance across the entire freight market and the inconsistency of state openings, and the impact on manufacturing and production. We're seeing carrier networks uh, completely disrupted. They're, you know, what they optimized yesterday in their software is no longer valid this morning. So they're constantly re-optimizing uh, their freight networks. And of course, what's that's doing in the last few weeks is we're seeing a lot more freight on the spot market uh, driving up the rates for, for flatbed, uh, dry van and reefer. So um, something that you said that I thought was really interesting is this question about freight re is about rejection. Um, do you think that there's a certain amount of that rejection that's being driven by um, desire not to go into the hot spots as opposed to like a difficulty getting a load out? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly what's happening. And based on my conversations with carriers uh, and owner operators this week, that's ex they're being very selective about where they go to because the normal balance of freight on a sort of a head haul back haul market is completely disjointed. And I was sort of I was fascinated by some loads I saw out of the Midwest market last week. Heading to uh, heading to New Orleans, and of course that, that the freight was most likely going into warehouses to get ready for hurricane season. But there was a, a higher percentage of loads uh, on the spot market because the contract carriers didn't want to go into a backhaul market where they had little chance of getting freight out. So I think what's happening 
uh, is that carriers are rejecting loads, even though volumes are down, they're rejecting more loads to try and keep their operating costs as tight as they can and minimise the number of empty miles. And I think a great example was the border freight markets last week, where if you look at our MCI map for reefer and dry van, you see a lot of red along the commercial zones across the border. Uh, there was a, a nationwide agricultural strike where farmers blocked border crossings with tractors. Uh, what that did is it caused carriers to both have delays crossing the border, but they also avoided the market. So what it did is it tightened capacity because there were fewer trucks coming into the market. And uh, if, even if you look at some of the data that uh, Geotab have been providing on, on daily truck crossings, uh, truck crossings on the northbound from Mexico to the US are up about 15% last week, but they're down 1% going south. So this imbalance creates um, an opportunity for carriers to be more selective, reject going into some markets because they know there'll be less freight coming out. And what that's done, particularly in the Laredo market, Ned, where uh, it's the biggest truck crossing market, about half the trucks cross from Mexico to the US and Laredo. Because of that tightness of capacity and carriers rejecting loads into the market, spot rates were up about 5% week over week. Um, out of there, and, and they're about four cents a mile higher than the national average. So that kind of explains market dynamics. Carriers are being more selective, but for those of our customers that operate in the spot market, um, good opportunity uh, at the moment. Yeah, what we were talking to a couple of large shippers this week, as well as our friends over at um, FMIC. And one of the interesting things that came up that I hadn't considered was if you're not familiar with transportation contracts, um, a lot of times you'll have like a fixed volume that you're contracted at and then surge volume, right? right? So for the sake of simplicity, let's just say that your fixed volume on a lane is 10 shipments per day and surging up to five. Yep. Uh, these carriers almost universe, these shippers almost universally said they're getting nearly a hundred percent rejection for all surge yep. volume. So the carriers want to protect the relationship and maintain and accept the base load volume, but there's almost no appetite for that surge volume. And what's driving the surge volume is that imbalance on the consumer demand side where we're seeing lumber, grills, uh, bicycles, right. any DIY type right. thing, uh, almost impossible to keep on shelf, but we're not seeing raw steel, auto parts, yeah. um, manufacturing goods. So um, it's interesting, it's something I hadn't considered to say like that marginal freight's getting accepted or declined at a much higher rate than the base exactly. freight. Yeah, it's exactly what's happening. So basically, everywhere is Florida, right? Like, like <laughs> you it, it, head hauling into Florida, you ha you always ask for a premium uh, because you're going to have difficulty back hauling out. So, like, I, I guess that's like a good first order mental model is that you know, uh, Atlanta is the new Jacksonville. Right. As much as I love our friends in Florida, I hope not. I don't <laughs> like the community as much. Um, All right. You know, so I, can they? Know. I, I want to, you know, before we wrap it up too soon, I, yeah. wanna, I want your, your net, your analogy, Ned, right? Because you're you're the most data sciencey person I I know, and I probably ever met. But I wanted you to walk through your speedometer analogy because I think it really will help relate as we wrap this up um, how to use data in this time. So um, the the analogy that I like to use is about using multiple data sources. So if you're driving your car, the first thing that you do if you're checking how fast you're going is you look at your speedometer. Like if you're driving a stick shift, you'll also look at your RPM and things. But if you're looking at your speedometer and your speedometer is saying like 55 miles an hour and you look out your window and there's some dude running past uh, and, and like going past your car, something is out of whack, right? Like you're... Either some your understanding of how fast people can go is wrong, or your understanding of what the speedometer is saying about the actual speed of the car is wrong. And being able to incorporate all of those extra data sources is really important in times like this. And that's one of the things that I feel like is very strong about DAT is we have so many different data sources that we can look at not necessarily like the first order or even the second order kinds of things that you would see you looking at those kind of like outer order stuff where there's a lot of information there but most of the time it only reflects what's happening in the main uh information channels but imperfectly but you have to rely on that when the main information channels stop carrying the information that you expect them to um, so we've been asked to to wrap it up. So let's 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 wrap it up. What do you guys think is the the expectation for for the future? Yeah, so I'll I'll, I'll kind of hit that and then and, and drive us home. You know, when I when I take a com combination of talking to customers, my own industry expertise, our internal discussions that we have, and then you know, kind of 
boiling that all down into one kind of neat little package, I think I, I break it down into three cases. I think the bull case, the optimistic case is that retail season is enough to carry the industry forward and we see some type of material recovery late in Q4. Um, I think the consensus, kind of the DAT uh, rubber stamp consensus, as well as other respected industry analysts that sort of kind of operate in our orbit is probably late Q1, early Q2 from a, a material recovery. What I mean by that is you'll know it when it's here, right? You'll see more alignment among the data sources, more alignment among the forward looking models, more of alignment among the ground truths when you talk to customers. Pessimistically, if the government continues to be the government and sort of bumble their way through um, recovery and PVP and uh, small business lending and all of that kind of stuff, and we see major regression um, back to kind of March levels on the economic front, it could be talking late 21 um, to a potential like unknown recovery state, both on a macro level and an industry level. So um, uh, if I was a betting person, which I'm not, I tend to, to buy barbecue grills and things like that instead of, instead of waste money in a casino, I would bank on late Q1, early Q2 of next year. Um, but that's why we, we track the data, right? We make, a, we make a prediction today. We're honest about it. Um, we tell you why we made it and what went into it. But if, if things change, if the conditions change, we'll update that accordingly and let you guys know. Uh, yeah. But with that, uh, we'll turn it over to Ned to wrap it up. Yeah, I just want to add one tiny thing about this. And I, I'm really sorry to our producer for, for running over. But um, just because the recovery isn't happening doesn't mean that rates aren't going to be up. And I think that's, that's one of the things that's really important is um, you can have these kinds of like, I would call these semi unsustainable run ups of rates during this kind of unusual time. And a recovery looks like a return to more of a normalcy as opposed to like high rates. And so the concern, at least from my perspective, is it's not the problem is not that the rates are high for people who like high rates. The problem is that there is going to be a correction at some point and when and how sharp that correction is and the degree to which that correction kind of wobbles back and forth and continues to overshoot is going to be large until there is that recovery and until things are back onto a normal path. So uh, to finish things up, I want to thank everybody for tuning into our show and I really uh, want to encourage people to subscribe. Um, subscribing means that, that more people listen to this and um, we're happy to uh, continue doing the show as long as people are, are interested in it. Um, a reminder for next week to please send in questions for our CEO, Claude. And uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us this week. Um, reminder that you can find these weekly updates in a text-based format on dat.com slash market update. Uh, email questions, including questions for Claude Pamelia to askiq at dat.com. And then we're also offering our top 50 lanes report for free if you email us at askiq at dat.com to receive those. Uh, we'll be back next week with a new update and an exciting guest and um i hope everybody has a chance to see the comet it's a once in a lifetime opportunity i'm doing it tonight go out go outside go out in the dark look at the comet it's cool the end <laughs>